the title of the conference, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. The title of the conference is Revolutionary Imagination, Chicago Surrealism from... Uh, did I leave my watch? Ah, uh, no, I did not. Here. Yeah. Uh, revolutionary uh, Chicago Surrealism from Object to Activism. And I, what I'm going to, the thoughts that I'm going to share with you today uh, very much bear on this title. The title of my own presentation is Critical Theory and Practice, Marcuse between Paris and Chicago, though the emphasis is going to be on Chicago. I'd like to start first by acknowledging Penelope Rosemont and indeed the memory of Franklin Rosemont. Um, when I arrived in Chicago, uh, my first stop in the United States 24 years ago, um, they were very kind to extend a welcome in sharing literature of their home. Partic they invited me to participate in gatherings, in publications, the Black, Brown, and Beige um, publication. Um, and uh, I, I've remained in touch on and off, and I've been inspired by their work, especially uh, as we were, some of us were discussing last night, I think that the existence of a Chicago Surrealist group is a really important example of the autonomous production of knowledge. Um, that is to say that knowledge is not something that only comes from the university context mm -hmm. or in a corporate context, and that it is extraordinary uh, and exemplary that we can have groups of all different kinds that continue to produce in an autonomous way. I would also like to thank Jennifer Cohen, who is still standing, I think, um, for uh, extraordinary efforts in organizing um, this event. And thanks to the Arts Club as well of Chicago for their work in the recognition of something that is within their midst. Um, let me begin uh, with an epigraph from the 1956 conversation between Adorno and um, Okaima. It is published in a small book by Verso called Towards a New Manifesto. And this is from a chapter called The Concept of Practice. Adorno, the central issue is how to relate theory and practice in general. Horkheimer, by practice, we mean re by practice, we really mean that we're, so, that we're serious about the idea that the world needs fundamental change. The world has to become different. In what follows, Marcuse, uh, and I'm going to be dealing with Marcuse Franklin Rosemont, and by implication, Vincent Bounor, who was the principal theoret theoretician in the post-dissolution surrealist movement that Michael Richardson talked about, um, that published in a journal called the Bulletin des Liaisons Surrealistes. I'm going to be looking at the correspondence um, between Franklin and Marcuse between 71 and 72 with an article by Marcuse called On Surrealism and the Revolution that was first published in the Bulletin de Liaison Surrealiste by Vincent de Nord's group in 1973 and only subsequently it published to the best of my knowledge, and I'm open to correction, in, Arsenal, in English in Arsenal Volume 4 in 1989 with a fuller body of correspondence. When the French published the material, they basically concentrate on the essay that Marcuse shared with Franklin in English. So when Rosemont is writing in 1989, there is very much a retrospective, uh, there is very much a retrospective aspect um, to it. So, and when Rosemont published this uh, material in 1989, he writes in a superb introduction called Herbert Marcuse and the Surrealist, and the Surrealist Revol Revolution. And he situates it as, um, as um, um, Dr. Susick has just done, Abigail Susick has just done, within the context of the Telos group. And I should like to say Telos is not just a group that published a journal, um, not that this is, by the way, that this is what Abigail was saying. I'd like to emphasize that Telos is the naturalization of critical theory within America. That is their cultural significance. There are many journals of critical theory, but Telos is the moment of the naturalization of critical theory as um, an American phenomenon. Why critical theory, practice, and revolutionary imagination 
In a sense, ladies and gentlemen, there is a homology between those three categories, critical theory, practice, and revolutionary imagination. And in order to grasp this, I think we need to go back to what is the key text here. And it is the unpublished text by Marx, written in the spring of 1845, but published for the first time as an appendix by Engels in his, in his book on the end of classical German philosophy. And it's the theses on Fahrbach. The theses on Fahrbach constitute the beginning of critical theory, and I should like to say is essential to the, his, to the theory of surrealism. In the thesis of Fahrbach, Mark, Marx introduces the concept of a new type of materialism, historical materialism, <coughs> which is not only the definition of Marxist thought, but what is crucial in the thesis on Fahrbach is that it is also the exit from philosophy, the exit from philosophy, and thereby the beginning, the initiation into a post-philosophical activity that will be that post-philosophical activity that will be called practice. The first and final theses are the ones that matter here. I should also say, ladies and gentlemen, that the word that it, when the the end marks and the end of classical German philosophy is the translation. The term that is normally translated as end, la fin, in French, as though to suggest the completion of something or the purpose of something, the German word is Ausgang. And that German word Ausgang means exit, the leaving of philosophy, the leaving behind of philosophy. And that is first stated in the first thesis on Fahrbach. I quote, the chief defect of all hitherto existing materialism, that of Fahrbach included, is that the thing, reality, sensuousness, is conceived only in the form of the object or of contemplation, but not as a sensuous human activity, practice, not, subjective, not subjectively. Hence, in contradistinction to materialism, the active side was developed abstractly by idealism which, of course, does not know real, sensuous activity as such. Fahrbach was once sensuous objects really dis to be really distinct from thought objects, but he does not conceive human activity itself as objective activity. Hence, in the essence of Christianity, he regards the theoretical attitude as the only genuinely human attitude, while practice is conceived and fixed only in its dirty Judaical manifestation. Hence, he does not grasp the significance of revolutionary, of practical, critical activity. Marx does not claim that his is the first materialism, manifestly was not. 18th century French thought is dominated by materialism. What Marx says is that there is a new kind of materialism that is historical materialism, that introduces a new concept of practice, where we do not grasp the subjective and the objective as opposed. Rather, that we see that the subjective and the objective are both themselves parts of, mutually implicated in activity, doing, action, transformation. And that once that we grasp this idea of a practice, of a doing, in other words, once we grasp this as embodied activity, then the way is open for Marx to say, in the thesis that became probably the most famous of the 11 theses, philosophers, the philosophers, thesis 11, have only interpreted the world in various, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways, the point is to change it. The point is to change it. <coughs> Andrew Breton will encounter this, these theses on Fahrbach in 1930. That is to say, he knows of them, but they're translated into French in 1930, along with the, as the appendix to the Engels book. And I'm going to have a little bit more to say about that in a moment. And from that moment, 
Breton will begin to say to link now poetry and philosophy, poetry and political thought in a new way. Transform the world, said Marx. Change life, said Rimbaud. These two orders are for us one and the same. This is the first expression of the, of the surrealist grasping the idea of practice. And just as for Marx, historical materialism is in fact the announcement of a distinctively Marxist way of thinking that is now no longer purely philosophical, it is not an accident that in the Second Manifesto in 1930, when André Breton, uh, uh, Breton and the Surrealists declare their allegiance, let me make sure I have the right quote here, declare their allegiance um, to historical, declare their allegiance to historical materialism. Our, we declare our allegiance to the principle of historical materialism. And just as Breton says, we declare our allegiance to historical materialism, he goes on to say, we intend, in other words, he now situates surrealism in relation to philosophical activity. We intend to place ourselves at a point of departure such that for us, philosophy will be surclassé, outclassed. Right? We intend to put ourselves in a position where we will outclass philosophy. That is to say, we will no longer be doing philosophy. Now, it is also a truism that any movement, be it anthropological, be it philosophical, uh, be it, be it, be it, um, be it political, that's be it scientific, that seeks to be beyond philosophy must itself have philosophical implications, even as it think, does not see itself as that. That is exactly what critical theory is. Critical theory is technically, is historically, is conceptually not philosophy. It is a post-philosophical activity. Philosophy has reached its conclusion. Philosophy has reached its apotheosis. Philosophy, that is to say, is understood in the Western tradition from the Greeks through to Kant and Hegel. We know what philosophy is. The point now is to change the world. And so technically, through practice, technically, critical theory is not philosophy per se. But likewise, surrealism, which challenges philosophy, must in some way be philosophical as well. So we intend to be in a position to outclass, to leave behind, to transcend philosophy. And what this shows, and this is why the emphasis is up on practice, is that surrealism, like Marxism, and so many other isms of the early 20th century, is anti-foundationalist. It is anti-foundationalist because it's like movements that say, we're going to be beyond painting, music that seeks to be not music, art that seeks to be anti-art, a certain type of writing that say philosophical activity that seeks to be anti-metaphysics, to go Heidegger, for example, to be beyond philosophy, a certain type of conceptual activity that doesn't produce concepts. For example, Derrida's concept of différence. It's not meant, supposed to be understood, says Derrida, as a concept. Or the concept of le dehors from Michel Foucault, but also used by Maurice Blanchot, which are not supposed to be concepts. And they're not supposed to be concepts because they're what makes the difference. But I would like to suggest that surrealism and Marxism are both in this respect anti-foundationalist movements of the 20th century. And that once we grasp this, the inherent critique the critique of philosophy, the exit from philosophy, produces a new kind of anthropological thinking, that is to say philosophical anthropological thinking, that takes us into practice, that takes us, that is to say, into direct relation with the world. Hence, transform the world, said Marx, change life, said Rimbaud, these two orders are for us one and the same. That is to say, we are a new order, anthropological order, based upon practice. Now, in the debate, so this for me is the philosophical, and I'm sketching, I'm moving quickly. Um, this is the philosophical framework for the correspondence between Franklin Rosemont and Herbert Marcuse. 
Of the, the original critical theorists, two, and I believe only two, have anything substantial to say about surrealism. Walter Benjamin, of course, and uh, from the beginning, and Herbert Marcuse. As Michael Richardson knows, I do not believe that Adorno has anything of any value to say about surrealism. That 1956 essay that he wrote on surrealism, I think, is an intellectual embarrassment. But in the correspondence with Walter Benjamin, in the letters, um, there is something quite extraordinary. And I don't think that we've even begun to get as much out of the correspondence as we can. And what, of course, Adorno does in the correspondence is systematically, at every moment, to block the surrealist derivation of Walter Benjamin's thought, right? In other words, he, at every step we can say he recognizes what is, what is surrealist, because what is surrealist in Benjamin is what, in fact, challenges traditional understanding of historical materialism, okay? And that is the significance, I think, of the correspondence, and it's truly, truly fascinating. I'm not the first to say that, but outside of those correspondence, the correspondence, I don't think that there is anything that we can find. Benjamin and Herbert Marcuse. In the debate between Rosemont and Vincent Gounod and Marcuse, I'm going to outline just two errors. I think it comes down to two things, and it's not because I like binarism, it's because I'm moving very quickly. Okay. One, where there is broad agreement on the nature of the imagination, the title of this conference, Revolutionary Imagination. There is broad agreement on what imagination is and the role of the imagination. And two, the second area, an area where there is profound disagreement, and I believe it's where today the debate that they conducted in the light of May 68, right, um, 1970, 71, still is extraordinarily relevant. And that is on the nature of consumer society and the role of workers within that consumer society. Um, both Michael and Abigail have brought out the great surrealist exhibition, Les Gars Absolu, um, which it's worth revisiting on its own. But I'm going to try and give another context where the surrealist Les Gars Absolu meets with um, Guy Debord's Société du Spectacle, the Society of the Spectacle, and of course, One Dimensional Man from Marcuse, which has an extraordinary impact when it is translated into French. The nature of consumer society. So imagination and consumer society, those I think are the two crucial things. The first, in the area of great agreement, and the second, um, not at all. Imagination. This is of course post-May 60, the context of this is post-May 68. And here I want to ask, have we left the context of May 68 in the context where uh, we are led to believe that so many workers uh, in the Midwest are responsible for the three percentage points that um, Donald Trump, um, that enabled Donald Trump to become president of the United States. Imagination, remember the quote from Breton, in the first manifesto, imagination is on the verge of reclaiming its rights. Oh, from May 6 to 68, and by the way, many of these slogans that sound situationist were actually not composed by the situationist. Imagination au pouvoir, l'imagination au pouvoir, the imagination in power. One of the things that was often commented on to the distress of Telkeliste is how suddenly surrealist ways of speaking and thinking made a comeback in 1968. At the core of the Rosemont Marcuse debate is an approach, a surrealist approach, and I quote Marcuse, to things and actions without their exchange value. I want to suggest is that this is in the, in the uh, correspondence, this is of, in Arsenal, uh, it's found, that quote is found on page 40. That is the key idea. Because the idea of looking at things, approaching things without their exchange values enables us on the one hand now to valorize imagination. Okay? Imagination. And at the same time, 
It allows us then to look at consumer society, where, which is dominated by, shaped by, exchange value. Second, imagination is negation. Imagination is the language of negation. This is part of the development of refusal. Imagination is above all, says Marcuse, it is the language of that which is absent. He never uses absence, always the adjectival form. It is the language of that which is absent. It is the language of the absent, quote, naming the things that are not, breaking the spell of things that are. Imagination, he sums this up, alluding to André Breton, is the great refusal. Those of you here who know of the Canadian surrealist, the Quebec surrealist, the Quebec automatiste, will, re will recall that their manifesto, written by Paul Emile Bourdieu, was called Refus Global, right? Global refusal or total refusal, refus global. So this idea of the grand refus is built into the surrealist sensibility world worldwide by the, time that, by the time that Marcuse comes to speak of imagination in action as the great refusal. He says it is a cognitive faculty capable of transcending and breaking the spell of the establishment. It is, he says, a meta-language of total negation. I quote, the most interesting aspect of the events of May 68, says Marcuse, is the coming together of Marx and Breton. Breton himself in the 1930s, in the midst of political turbulence in the 1930s, brings together Marx and Rimbaud, right? And Marcuse now is bringing together Breton and Marx. The most interesting aspect of the events of May 68 is the coming together of Marx and Breton. Imagination in power, and he says, the graffiti of the jeunesse en colère, uh, the French is in the original, the angry youth, joined, that is brought together, joined together, Karl Marx and André Breton. The new sensibility has become, he says, a political force, unquote. One thing that I would like to say here, and maybe we can pick up in the, the, discussion, the, the, the discussion later, is that there is nothing new in this language. Absolutely nothing new. The concept of the imagination that he's working with, yes, it is present in surrealism, but it's also present in early German Romanticism. And I think that here and there, Franklin Romont, Rosemont picks up on this and says, you know, yes, Marcuse is in line with us on this, but his reading is of surrealism proper is relatively limited. In fact, in more than one place, and quite angrily in a couple of places, he says how restricted Marcuse's reading is. Marcuse, um, sorry, Franklin Rosemont and Vincent Bounod, um, the, from the French post-dissolution surrealist group, think that this is because Marcuse is applying Kantian categories of 